A 34-year-old hermit gets hit by a truck, waking up as Rudius, a baby in a foreign land. He remembers everything from his previous life and figures he must be in a rural European village. That is, until his mother, Zenith, uses magic to heal him. Now it makes sense why his dad, Paul, practices swordsmanship every day. He's in a totally different world. At age two, he decides to try and learn magic himself. Finding a book on it, he takes a year to learn how to read and finds out he can use magic without incantations, using his knowledge of video games to aid him. After practicing and increasing his abilities, he decides it's time to try intermediate magic, accidentally destroying a part of the house and alerting his parents. They decide to hire him a tutor, Roxy, who isn't too thrilled about teaching a kid so young, not believing his parents. But when he gets distracted during an incantation, she learns that he can cast without them, becoming jealous, though recognizing his potential. As for Rudius, he has a second chance and promises himself he won't waste it as he did in his previous life. Practicing earth magic and passing out, he remembers how he threw it all away to save some kids. Maybe it wasn't that useless. After six months, he can use intermediate magic with no problem. During a lesson, Rudius learns that Roxy is a demon. That's why his parents were surprised to see her. There's a demon race, the Superd, who has been feared for the past 400 years. Sometimes, her hair is mistaken as green, like the Superd's. After a year and a half, they celebrate his fifth birthday. Apparently, they only celebrate every five years. He receives a real sword from his dad, a new book from his mom, and a wand from Roxy but she's afraid there's nothing more she can teach him about magic. So the next day, she plans on holding his graduation ceremony. Being bullied in his previous life left him with a crippling fear of going outside. Rudius becomes terrified when Roxy tells him they must leave town for the ceremony. But when he realizes the villagers aren't looking at him but greeting Roxy, his anxiety is put at ease. She shows him the strongest water spell she can cast accidentally hitting their horse with a bolt of lightning. No wonder they had to leave town. Rudius replicates her saint-level spell, successfully graduating, though he isn't ready to say goodbye to the person who got him to go outside after 20 years. His parents are relieved that he's going outside now. They thought he was sickly, never crying as a baby, or doing most things regular kids do. He notices three kids ganging up on another and decides to save him remembering all the times the same thing happened to him. While trying to help him clean up, Rudius notices his green hair, reminding him of Roxy's story of the Superds, who have green hair and a red gem on their forehead. He's relieved at the absence of a gem. Rudius decides to befriend and teach magic to the kid, who introduces himself as Sylph. He's proud of himself for sticking up for someone, but when he gets home, his dad isn't too happy that he allegedly gave one of the bullies a black eye. He continues teaching Sylph for the next six months when he wonders how to use incantationless casting, finding out he's not as special as he thought. When they go to take a bath after getting caught in the rain, Rudius discovers that Sylph is actually Sylphiette, only to make things worse by admitting he thought she was a boy the whole time. Some time goes by before she approaches Rudius and the two make up. Paul and Zenith are excited when they find out she's pregnant, which is short-lived when Lilia, the maid, finds out she's pregnant too. Paul immediately admits it's most likely his. It's decision time. If Lilia has to travel back to her hometown with a newborn, they might not make it. Rudius decides to take the initiative and place all the blame on Paul so that Zenith does too. Lilia used to be afraid of Rudius, but takes a liking to him after he lies to help her and her baby out, and she becomes a part of the family. Now, Rudius has two little sisters. The topic of school comes up, and Rudius considers it, since he hasn't been making progress in swordsmanship or magic, but Sylphiette doesn't want him to leave. One day, he receives a letter from Roxy, urging him to go to Renoa Magic Academy. He asks his parents whether he could take Sylphiette, the family doesn't have enough money to send them both. So, Rudius figures it's time to get a job. A friend of the family, Ghislaine, arrives soon after, and Paul ends up knocking Rudius out. 
he wakes up in a cart with Ghislaine without any idea of what's going on. She throws him a letter that his father wrote. Apparently, he's being sent to teach magic to another child for the next five years. The letter also tells him not to return home or contact Sylphiette as she's been hindering his development. Arriving in Roa, he meets Philip Boreas Grey Rat, the mayor, and his father's cousin. He had no clue he had family with such high standing, nor does he know he'll be teaching Philip's daughter, who beats him up during their first meeting. Now it makes sense that nobody wants to teach her. So Rudius comes up with a plan to stage a kidnapping and show Eris how useful magic can be. The kidnappers are a little too good at their job. She's still hostile to Rudius, who plans to leave her behind if she refuses to cooperate. They escape and make their way back to Roa, though it turns out the kidnapping wasn't as staged as they planned. She begrudgingly accepts him as a tutor after he rescues her instead of taking the scoundrel's bribe. Philip is grateful, but cautions him against revealing his family ties due to the political landscape. It's official, his first job. Ghislaine takes up his swordsmanship training, while Rudius teaches her and Eris how to use magic, and how to read, write, and do arithmetic. But not long after, Eris starts acting up again, so he decides to give her a day off. Once in a while won't hurt, and they all go to town for the day. A merchant tries to sell him an aphrodisiac, as he attempts to figure out the market price of general goods and convert it into yen. After Rudius refuses to let Eris buy him a book, he decides to get her an allowance. She finally starts paying attention in class after getting regular time off, and she buys him a present with her new allowance. Eris' 10th birthday is fast approaching. As a noble, she needs to learn how to dance. Giving up a few lessons a week to her dance teacher, Rudius finally has some free time of his own. He decides to learn new languages, but finds demon god especially difficult. Apparently, dance instructions aren't going so well, so the teacher asks Rudius to convince Eris to return to classes. His free time is short-lived as he gets sucked into helping with dance practice. Rudius begins selling some of the figurines he's learning to make using earth magic for some extra money. One day, he receives a package from Roxy. Since he's still having trouble figuring out the demon god language, she handwrites a textbook for him. Roxy's new student is obsessed with her and ends up getting his hands on one of Rudius Roxy figurines. At Eris' 10th birthday party, she embarrasses herself during her first dance. Nobles aren't supposed to have two left feet, so Rudius ends up stepping in and uses her swordsmanship training. Using feints keeps her from fainting. Rudius gives both Eris and Ghislaine wands as a present, though she's more excited about receiving a ring from Ghislaine he accidentally interrupts her grandfather, Sauros, with a maid. He points out a giant red orb in the sky, though tells him not to worry about it. It only gets bigger over time. Rudius overhears planning for his surprise 10th birthday party. He learns why they can't be too public about his presence. It isn't Paul's reputation, but his name. There's a coup planned in the Notos branch, and Rudius is a contender. They gathered the best materials in the kingdom to make a staff for his birthday. He's disappointed that his family couldn't come, finding out that there's been an increase in monster activity lately. Eris's mom breaks down, saying she'll adopt him. No, he should marry her daughter. Philip explains that his sons were adopted by his brother, so his wife hated him until now. But if he so chooses, Philip will handle the coup, and all he needs to do is marry Eris. She waits for Rudius in his room that night, but he goes a bit too far, and she pushes him away. He apologizes. She forgives him and makes a promise to wait until his 15th birthday. Back in his hometown, his father is busy fighting monsters, while a strange mana cloud appears in the sky. Rudius takes Eris and Ghislaine out of the city to show them his strongest spell using his new staff. When they're attacked, it's someone named Almanfi allegedly sent by the legendary hero Perugius Dola to find the source of the disturbance. Ghislaine reveals she's a sword king while protecting and vouching for him. Suddenly, there's a giant flash of blue light. Rudius holds on to Eris as they're enveloped. Rudius wakes up in a strange liminal space, looking like his past self. A mysterious white figure introduces himself as the man-god 
and offers to help after watching him for a while. He's relieved to find he's still alive in the new world and not dead again. Apparently, he's now stranded on the demon continent. The man-god tells him that when he wakes up, there will be a man there. He just has to rely on him and help him no matter what. He wakes to find a man with green hair and something red in the center of his forehead. At first, he's wary, but when he speaks demon god, the man is taken aback at how courteous Rudius is, admitting that it would be rude to fear the man who saved them. Introducing himself as Ruigerd Superdia, he swears to protect the children while helping them get back home. Eris wakes up terrified when she sees him, but she comes around after some convincing. They come across a village, though the children are too suspicious, barring their entry. Ruigerd gets him to speak with the chief, which he does telepathically. When the chief notices the necklace Rudius is wearing, he mentions Roxy's name. The man who originally turned them away freaks out. Apparently, Roxy is his daughter, and he hasn't seen her in 20 years. They're allowed entry into the village and explain how they came to be on the demon continent. The chief is worried about Ruigerd escorting them, since soup herds aren't allowed in cities. He responds that he'll just kill everyone in the city, if that's the case. He becomes angry when Rudius asks if it's true they turned on their allies in the war. Ruigerd explains how the demon god, Laplace, gave his tribe cursed spears during the war 400 years ago, turning soup herds into cold-blooded killers who slaughtered their own families in their insanity. As the leader of the tribe, it's his duty to clear their names. Rudius promises he'll do whatever it takes to help. Eris is ecstatic that she's not helpless now, using the sword Roxy's parents gifted them to help on the road. But their happiness soon drains away when they see the security at the first demon city they arrive at. They're on the lookout for Dead End, which turns out to be Ruigerd's nickname. Rudius gets the idea of dyeing his hair blue and giving him Roxy's necklace to disguise him as a member of the Magurdia tribe. They decide to join the Adventurer's Guild to make some money and put on a show announcing Ruigerd as Dead End and using it as their party name so nobody takes it seriously. Rudius figures that if they start doing good deeds under the party name Dead End, the news will spread, lessening people's fears of the superds. He's visited by the man-god in his dreams again, who tells him to accept the low-ranking quest to find a lost cat. The next day, using his third eye, Ruigerd easily finds the place they're looking for. The cat is a bit bigger than they assumed at the outset. The kitty kidnappers are easily restrained with earth magic. Before getting answers out of them, Ruigerd decapitates one after he kicks Rudius. They argue over killing people, regardless of whether they're evil, since they're trying to promote a good image. The other kidnappers explain how they're adventurers who wait until someone posts a job to return their pets and collect the reward. This confirms Ruigerd's suspicions, though he gets frustrated when the kids stop him a second time. Instead of killing them, Rudius decides to use the kidnapper's higher rank in the guild to get tougher jobs. Roxy travels to Roa, looking for Rudius, and becomes relieved when she doesn't find his or his family's names on the death list. Paul writes a letter to let him know that he and his sister Norn are alive, but it never reaches his son. Meanwhile, Dead End searches for a mysterious monster lurking in a forest. They see a party of three younger demons they've encountered before, arguing with another party. It seems they're all looking for the same beast. When they look for it on their own, Ruigerd stops the group as he's worried about the demon children, so they agree to follow them, just in case. Rudius stops Ruigerd from stepping in again when the party is attacked by two monsters at once, thinking it would be best to save them and bolster their names. But his intentions don't match reality, as one of the demon children is killed immediately. No amount of healing magic would save him now. Ruigerd berates Rudius for holding him back and letting a child die. The other demons defend him by accepting the blame. They knew the risks, and they took them anyway. It wasn't their job to save them. Ruigerd apologizes and acknowledges them as warriors. After walking the kids to the edge of the forest, they hear the sound of another monster, only to find another party dead. They never stood a chance. It was too late to save them, though they avenge their death by killing the giant serpent. Back in the city, 
one of the guild members calls them out for working with another group to take on tougher jobs, and blackmails them. Noticing Rudius about to lose it, intending to kill the demon to protect Eris, Ruigerd washes the dye out of his hair, threatening their blackmailer. After being found out, he quickly leaves town before the guards catch him for being a superd. The three meet up on the outskirts, and Ruigerd admits that he finally understands what Rudius has been trying to do, and acknowledges him as a warrior. Instead of arguing after the fact, the three agree to hold meetings before making big decisions. They make their way to the coast, while Roxy and two of Paul's former traveling companions arrive by boat in search of survivors. Rudius, Eris, and Ruigerd arrive at the southernmost part of the demon continent around the same time as Roxy and her travel companions. The trio learns that booking passage back to the continent of Melis will cost 200 green ore coins, a sum they've never made in a year. That night, Rudius is visited by the man-god, who instructs him to buy food from a street vendor and take a stroll through the back alleys, but doesn't elaborate further. So, the following morning, he tells the others he wants to split up for the day. Eris and Ruigerd go to train on the beach, while Rudius follows the man-god's cryptic advice. He comes across a woman begging for food, and offers her what he bought from the street vendor. She thanks him for saving her life, and introduces herself as Kishirika Kishirisu, the Demon Emperor. Rudius isn't buying it, but decides to play along just to humor her. She's ecstatic that someone is finally giving her the respect she deserves, and offers to grant him one wish. However, money, fame, and power are totally off the table. She's a demon, not a genie. She tells him that one should ask for a demon eye if they ever find themselves in such a situation. So he agrees. She then proceeds to grab his head, gouge out his eye, and replace it with that of a demon, and then leaves. Rudius is utterly confused and starts seeing strange shifting outlines and silhouettes. A man runs into him and starts chewing him out, but then the young mage knocks him out of the way of a falling vase, as if he can somehow see into the future. It takes him a week to get used to using it, and he's able to see a couple of seconds into the future. To test out his foresight, he and Eris duel, and he comes out on top, able to predict her movements. However, when he tries the same tactics with Ruigerd, he gets creamed. That night, Rudius tries to sneak out, only for Ruigerd to catch him. He calls the young mage out on planning to sell his staff, which would only serve to fracture their party. Rudius says it's their only choice, unless they find a smuggler and the superd compromise his values. Ruigerd agrees to this, but only until they cross the ocean. Suddenly, they notice someone hiding in the shadows. It's the man Rudius saved from the falling vase. He overheard their need for a smuggler. Roxy and her companions, Elena Lise and Talhand, former party members of Paul, continue their search for his family. They hear rumors about Dead End, but decide it's best to avoid the group altogether, wholly unaware that they're exactly who they're searching for. They nearly run into each other a few times before they leave the port town. Gallus Cleaner, the smuggler, agrees to take Ruiger if they liberate some stolen goods upon arrival. Eris spends the whole trip seasick. Once they arrive, Rudius goes to retrieve Ruigerd at some underground smuggler's den. He walks past cages of beast people crying out in pain and tries not to make eye contact, wincing the entire time. When he makes it to Ruigerd's cell, the superd tells him that the captives are just children and they've already executed one for stepping out of line. Rudius doesn't have to get his hands dirty. He'll take out the smugglers while the young mage frees the children. Rudius heals their wounds and Ruigerd reappears. They gather the kids to bring them to the nearest town. They get outside, but the children are worried about the sacred dog they left behind, so Rudius goes back for it. He gets to the cage and discovers the dog surrounded by a magical barrier, which he easily breaks. The excited dog thankfully licks his face, and he starts petting it when a beast person appears. The man accuses him of fondling the sacred beast and incapacitates him. Another beast person appears, and they decide that one will bring Rudius and the dog back to their village while the other heads in the direction of the children. The young mage finds himself imprisoned in a cage suspended above a beast person village. 
After a few days, Geese, a man caught cheating at dice, is thrown in with him. Rudius tries to get him to tell him how to get back to town, but the guy just wants to serve his time. He isn't about to make a break for it. One evening, Rudius notices the guard is missing, and he begins to smell smoke. The forest is suddenly engulfed in flames. Their cage ignites, and the two escape, grabbing their gear on the way. It's pandemonium on the forest floor, as beast people get slaughtered by mercenaries among the flames. Rudius can't just look the other way and decides to save his captors. He wields his staff, collects as much cold air as he can, and unleashes a rainstorm to quell the flames. One of the tribesmen recognizes him, but there's no time to debate. There are children that need saving. Gallus appears from the shadows, holding a kid hostage. He goes on to explain that he was the one who captured the kids in the first place, hoping that Rudius and Ruigerd would free them to draw out the warriors, so they could pillage the village without opposition. Rudius decides to stand by the beast people, and Gallus begins cutting down their warriors. Geese recognizes his sword skills as North God style. Apparently, Gallus is Saint class. Rudius debates whether to back off, but when the kid calls out for help and the sacred beast comes to the rescue, he has no choice but to take action. Using his new demon eye, and with the help of Geese and the sacred beast, they defeat Gallus. Unfortunately though, Rudius takes a knife in the leg and passes out. He wakes up later, surrounded by his friends. The beast people apologize and thank him for saving their children. Meanwhile, Eris' grandfather is overthrown in a coup, sentenced to death in a kangaroo court, and is executed on the spot. One night, Gaius notices that Eris' ring bears the mark of their tribe. When he learns that Ghislaine gave it to her, he takes his daughter and leaves. Eris refuses to let it go, though, and follows them outside to defend her teacher. It shocks him to learn that both Eris and Rudius actually have respect for her. Later, Gaius' daughter and her friend seek out Eris to ask about Ghislaine. It turns out that she's Gaius' sister, making her Tona's aunt. Eris tells the girls that despite her disinterest in studying, she always enjoyed her lessons with Ghislaine. Tona sees her sword and demands she teach her how to wield it like her aunt. Gaius listens in on the conversation in secret, worried about his daughter and curious about his sister. He seeks out Rudius to ask about her and is surprised to learn that Ghislaine is a sword king. Eris continues Tona's training, and she rapidly improves. The rainy season is coming to an end, however, so Rudius and company will be able to leave soon, something Tona doesn't want to hear. She fights with Eris. Rudius and Gaius are alerted, and they come to break it up. Later, Gaius tells his daughter that they are leaving tomorrow. He tells her about how Ghislaine was taken in by a traveling swordsman, and he now regrets not trying harder with her. If she doesn't make up with Eris, she may come to have a similar regret. So that night, the girls apologize and come to an understanding. The next morning, Gaius requests a duel with Eris to see his sister's sword style in action. The two square off and charge at each other, crossing blades once. Rudius is confused. Nothing seemed to have happened, yet their sparring session ends with each expressing respect for the other. The group says their goodbyes and heads out. Geese yells after them and jumps in the cart, having broken out of his cage. After a while, they make it to the capital of the holy lands of Milis, Milition. Before they enter the city, Geese leaves the party, but tells them to visit the Adventurer's Guild. Rudius suggests they stay in the city for a month or so, to work and save up to make the next leg of their journey more comfortable. He also plans to make more Ruigerd figurines to bolster the Superd's image. While writing a letter to his family, Rudius sees a man on a horse race by with someone tied up and hooded. Another kidnapping victim? He follows them to what looks like a storehouse. The young mage sneaks in to do a little stealth recon. That is, until he discovers a pair of panties and involuntarily reveals his position. He takes out the guards, and more come in to see what the ruckus is about. After dealing with them, their captain comes in, barely able to stand and still drinking. Rudius feels that there's something familiar about the man. When he gets his mask cut off, the man recognizes his own son. They head to a tavern, 
and the young mage spins some tales about his adventures, which only pisses his old man off. He reams him out for not trying to find anyone else, revealing that their entire family, their entire community, was caught in the mass teleportation. But Rudius had no idea. He never got any correspondence, so how could he? To top it off, his sister doesn't even recognize him anymore. That night, Eris tries to console Rudius. It turns out that Paul and Norn were teleported to Millis and began searching for their family. However, Paul quickly fell into old bad habits, including drinking heavily. Geese shows up at the bar, apparently already acquainted with Paul. He tries to talk some sense into the drunkard. The kid's only 11 and survived the demon continent. Geese was born and raised there, so he's able to explain how barren and hostile the land is, especially towards a kid. The only reason Rudius bragged and told the story like it was an adventure was to impress and not worry his father. Paul takes this to heart. He might not be as entirely in the right as he thought. The next day, Paul goes to make amends with his son. He tells Rudius that there's nothing back home, but Rudius says he'll go anyway, and afterwards he'll look for his mom and sister. The bartender comes over and gives them a drink on the house and tells the kid he might want to look his dad in the eye. Rudius realizes how their conversation is affecting his dad. He proposes they pretend like yesterday never happened and start over. He runs up and hugs his father, and they both break down. Back in their room, Rudius, Aris, and Ruigerd have a meeting to discuss the next steps. Paul gave them some money and a letter of safe passage, so they don't have to stick around to save. Rudius warns Aris that they might not find anything when they get back home, but she's not a fool. She had already prepared herself for that possibility. The following day, Paul and Norn say goodbye to Rudius, and the trio sets off. They charter a boat back to the central continent, and thanks to Paul's letter, Ruigerd doesn't have to be smuggled, and he's the only one who can keep his stomach on the voyage. On the demon continent, Roxy talks with an old friend, her former party member, he asks if she's been to see her parents yet since she's been back, and is kind of outraged that she hasn't. The mage is reluctant due to her inability to use telepathy, a skill everyone in her home village has. But he's right, and she musters the courage to make the visit. When she gets there, the villagers look surprised when they figure out she's not telepathic, and she internalizes it as being akin to an outsider. She arrives at her parents' house, and they're over the moon to see her. She tells them that she can't stay, but when her mom breaks down and she notices they've kept her childhood belongings, she succumbs and apologizes profusely for running away without saying anything. She ends up staying the night and finds out in the morning that Rudius had stopped by with Eris and Ruigerd almost two years prior. She puts two and two together and finally figures out that the trio were the ones calling themselves dead end. She says goodbye and promises to visit every 20 years or so, maybe every 50, and heads off with her party to look for Rudius' other family members. Meanwhile, Rudius is contacted by the man-god in another dream, who asks him to trust him going forward if this new advice pans out. He then shows him a scene of Aisha, his sister, and tells him to save her without revealing his true identity. After that, he's to send word to someone he knows in Shiron Palace, if he follows these instructions, he'll be able to save both Lilia and Aisha. The trio lands on the central continent and heads to the capital of Chiron. Rudius tells the others that Aisha and Lilia are somewhere in the city, but leaves out the bit about the man-god being his source. While walking the streets alone, Rudius notices that someone is following him. He takes to the back alleys to throw them off and places his hand on the ground to erect a wall. The young mage turns around and pauses when he recognizes the alley from the vision. He hears the voice of a young girl and removes the barrier, revealing two guards confiscating a letter from her. They try to play it off, but it's kind of hard to explain their harassment of the girl. She breaks free and asks Rudius for help, so he uses incantationless magic to get them out of there, which alerts the guards to his identity. The girl introduces herself as Aisha. Rudius, remembering what the man-god said, tells her that people call him the Moonlight Knight. Apparently, her mother is being held captive, and the letter is for her father. 
She's been trying to get the word out, but all her letters have been confiscated before being sent. The young mage tries to probe her about her older brother, but Aisha believes he's a pervert. Good thing the man-god told him to keep his identity a secret. He tells her that she shouldn't worry, he'll save her mom. The next morning, a member of the Imperial Guard requests his presence at the royal palace, allegedly at the behest of his master, Roxy. Excited, he grabs his things and tells the others. Eris almost reveals his identity, but luckily Aisha is a heavy sleeper. The guard says that Roxy told them all about his incantationless casting. Instead of going through the front door, she directs him to a side entrance. He recognizes the two guards from the other day, but the thought of seeing Roxy clouds his judgment. A voice beckons for him to enter. When he does, he notices Lelia tied up on the ground. But before he can do anything, the guards pull the rug out from under him and he falls into a trap. The young man introduces himself as Pax, the seventh prince of Chiron, and reveals that Roxy isn't there. Apparently, his plan is to use Rudius to bait her into coming back. Later, Pax's older brother Zanuba descends the stairs and asks about the Ruijured figurine they found among his belongings. Rudius tries to avoid answering any questions about it to not implicate himself in anything. But he's completely taken aback when Zanuba reveals the Roxy figurine he bought in the market. The prince practically foams at the mouth about the mastery of the figure's construction. Rudius notices her mole missing. The prince realizes his mistake in removing it and then literally begins foaming at the mouth. Rudius has now exposed himself as the true craftsman and Zanoba falls to his knees and begs Rudius to teach him. Meanwhile, Eris, Ruijard, and Aisha meet with some of the guards. They reveal that Pax holds their families under constant threat to force their obedience. They beg them for help. Ruijard tells Eris to keep Aisha safe while he frees their families. Rudius agrees to make Zanoba his apprentice if he can free him from the magical barrier. Apparently, Zanuba is a blessed child, born with incredible strength. He's known for decapitating anyone who gets in his way. So, to free Rudius, he grabs his brother Pax by the neck and drags him out of bed down to Rudius' prison. Eris follows after him, wanting to see his strength, and Aisha tails behind her. When they get there, the guard refuses to help Pax, as his brother begins to slowly pull his head from his body. Since their families are no longer in danger, Pax no longer has a hold over the guards, and he submits before his brother decapitates him. Rudius is freed, as well as Lilia, and the tyranny of Pax is over. Lilia gives Rudius the box with Roxy's panties, along with the pendant that Sylphie made for his 10th birthday. Everybody says goodbye, and Aisha yells from the carriage a little way up the road, apologizing for calling her brother a pervert having known his true identity the whole time. The trio makes it to the mountains. While resting for the night, Ruijert tells Eris that she's now a full-blown warrior. The next day, while walking on a mountain path, Eris and Ruijert freeze, confusing Rudius. Two figures appear ahead of them, a man and a woman. When they walk by, Ruijert tells the others not to move a muscle. The figures pause, and the man wonders aloud, calling Ruijard and Eris by name, but he doesn't recognize Rudius. The Superd demands an explanation for how he knows them, but the man turns and tells his companion that it's not important, and they excuse themselves. Rudius asks them to wait, however, which shocks the others. The man introduces himself as Orsted, and Rudius asks how he knows his friends. He replies that he doesn't. When Orsted figures out who he is, he mentions that Paul shouldn't have a son. He points out that Rudius can match his gaze, and asks if he knows the man-god. Rudius immediately says that he does, and even admits that he appears in his dreams. Orsted lunges, and Ruijard pushes the young mage out of the way, telling him to grab Eris and run. Ruijard can barely keep up, and Orsted makes quick work of him. Rudius is stricken with fear and frozen in place. Eris tries to come to his rescue, but Orsted casts her aside and grabs Rudius, crushing his lungs. He tells the boy to give the man-god a message. Dragon-god Orsted is about to end this once and for all. 
Eris tries to cast a fireball, to no effect. This gives Rudius a moment to attack. He infuses a ball of energy with multiple elements and launches it at the Dragon God, surprising him with the sheer amount of mana. Orsted approaches the boy, picks him up, and pierces his chest with his bare hand. Rudius passes out, and the Man God appears in his dream. Apparently, he can't see the Dragon God due to a curse. In fact, there are multiple curses on the Dragon God. One of them causes every living being to fear and or hate him. But Rudius is unaffected by it, maybe because he came from another world. To his surprise, the Man God reveals that he's not dead yet. Rudius wakes up, and Eris tells him that Orsted came back to heal him after the woman whispered something to him. Later, Ruigerd asks Rudius who the Man God is, and he tells him everything. When he reveals that the fear of the Superds is a curse that's almost faded, Ruigerd breaks down, relieved that their attempts haven't been in vain, and there's still hope for him and his tribe. They get through the mountains and make it to what remains of Rudius' childhood home. Ruigerd says it's time for him to take his leave, and thanks them for everything they've done for him. He's in their debt. Rudius tells him to keep Roxy's necklace as a token of their friendship. Ruigerd tells them they'll meet again, and departs, leaving the two to their tears. They make it to Roa, which has been reduced to rubble, only harboring a camp for refugees now. Upon entering the camp, they see Ghislaine, and Eris rushes to embrace her. Alphonse, her servant, appears and tells Rudius to wait outside but Eris insists he remain. He goes on to tell them that both her parents perished, and her grandfather was tried and executed as a scapegoat responsible for the mana disaster. Her future, then, is that of a concubine to one of their lords. Eris demands to be left alone to grieve. That night, Eris enters Rudius' tent and says she wants to go through with their promise to sleep together. At first, he's hesitant, since they were supposed to wait until his 15th birthday, not hers, though her subtle powers of persuasion win him over. The next morning, Rudius wakes up to find she's gone, and in her place, a note saying they're not a good match right now. Alphonse tells him she left with Ghislaine, but can't tell him where they went. This completely destroys him, having finally lost his virginity only for the person he loves to leave the first chance she got. He remembers his past life and the incident that led to his complete withdrawal from society. Alphonse tries to get Rudius out of bed to enlist his magical ability to help out with a few things their recovering community needs, and they can't support him if he doesn't start helping out. He tells the boy that he intends to announce that Eris had died shortly after the teleportation incident, but not right away. That would be bad for morale. Ruigerd helps some men on the road. Instead of fearing him for being a superb, they react with curiosity and humility. Elsewhere, Eris tells Ghislaine that she felt like she was holding Rudius back and that she wants to get stronger for him. She loves him, but she wants to be someone he can rely on as well. On the demon continent, Roxy runs into Kishirika, the demon emperor who grants her one wish for helping her out. Instead of taking a demon eye, she asks for the locations of Rudius and his family. To her surprise, she reveals that Paul and Norn have been reunited with Aisha and Lilia. Zenith is somewhere on the Begarit continent, and Rudius made it back to the central continent. So Roxy and her party decide to embark for Begarit in search of Zenith. Rudius is still depressed, but knows that his mother is still missing so he gets up and sets off to find her. Rudius heads north in search of Zenith, his mother. On the journey, some adventurers he's sharing a wagon with note how depressed he looks. He's still down and out over the sudden departure of Eris. Upon arriving in a small village, he shocks the innkeeper by overpaying for his room. The next day, he heads down to look for work at the local guild. The other adventurers don't take him seriously because of his age. As he asks the guild clerk if she would officially disband his party, they wonder if he's the only survivor of some tragic incident. He tries to take on a job alone, when the adventurers from the caravan offer to work with him. He accepts after some persuasion. They'll set out the following day after some preparations. Early the next morning, the group is surprised he showed up. 
and even more so when he tells them about his ability to cast spells without incantations. The party members introduce themselves. Suzanne, the sub-leader. Timothy, leader of the party and long-range caster. Mimir, the healer. Patrice, the frontline fighter. And Sarah, the archer, who's not a fan of Rudius right off the bat. Suzanne chastises her for her poor manners. One day, she might have to party with others, and she should learn to get along with all kinds of people. At night, Timothy goes over their prey, luster grizzlies, who can't see well in the dark, and Suzanne goes over their strategy. When Rudius offers to help out with more than he's been assigned, Sarah is quick to point out that he has no standing among them and should just do what he's told. Timothy apologizes when the two are alone and expresses how impressed he is with his incantationless casting. The party comes upon their prey, sleeping in a group. Timothy starts pelting them with fire spells, and Rudius stops them with earth magic as they get up to retaliate. Things seem to be going pretty well when Rudius notices something and puts his ear to the ground. It's a pack of black grizzlies covered in mud. Timothy orders them to retreat, but Rudius realizes it's too late. They're stuck. Instead of attempting to flee, he accepts his fate, feeling that he's already lost everything. However, Suzanne intervenes. She's not about to let some kid she just met die. They're surrounded. The party resolves to fight them off, though they're outnumbered. Rudius' heart starts pounding. He wonders why he's so excited, and it dawns on him how much he enjoys this. He finds his will to fight, just as another wave of bears appears before the battered party. He tells the others not to worry. He's got this. The young mage raises his staff, conjures a giant ball of fire, and launches it at the bears, taking them out in one fell swoop. Suzanne thanks him for saving them, and even Sarah follows suit and shows some appreciation. When the party returns to the guild, the rest of the adventurers are apprehensive about the outsiders. That is, until Timothy offers to buy everyone around in celebration of completing their first job in this town. That night, Rudius sits by the fire and contemplates his newfound will to live. He breaks down, reminding himself that he hasn't lost everything. Despite being on his own for the moment, he's not alone in the world. He tosses the lock of Eris's hair into the flickering flames. A few months later, the young mage is still locally working as an adventurer, building up his reputation. The plan is to get his name out there to hopefully reach his mother's ears. One day, he heads to the guild, where a party of adventurers called Stepped Leader boasts about taking a job clearing the snow drakes from Ilbron Cave. A few other adventurers thank Rudius for his recent endeavors, calling him by his new nickname, Quagmire. They even promise to keep an eye out for news about his mother. He takes a simple job and uses his magic to help the town clear snow, while Sarah secretly watches from afar. He runs into her later, and she invites him to join the party for their next job. The young mage debates helping them out, concerned that working with a party does little to bolster his reputation, but ends up joining them anyway. They arrive at the ruins of a fortress in a giant cavern, and Rudius marvels at the architecture. Suddenly, his demon eye shows him a vision of Sarah stumbling, and he quickly runs up to catch her, accidentally groping her in the process. They happen upon a snowdrake scale, which is perfect since their objective is to collect them. The party is then attacked by a pack of the scaly creatures, and they run for their lives. Rudius makes an effort to slow the pursuers and finds himself separated from the group and vulnerable. Not capable of leaving the poor kid behind, the party returns to aid him. They quickly realize that the drakes aren't there for them, but they are fleeing. Some unexpected assistance arrives in the form of the party's stepped leader. The threat eliminated, the leader socks Timothy in the jaw and yells at them for stealing their prey. Rudius recalls them mentioning something about Ilbron Cave, and Suzanne goes off about how that's at least a day's journey from where they are. Timothy rationally resolves the dispute by explaining that they're there on a different job, and the other party's leader apologizes. The group returns to town and encourages Rudius to join them for a drink for once. Suzanne teases Sarah for uncharacteristically, even passionately, jumping in to help Rudius. The leader of Step to Leader drunkenly stumbles towards them and apologizes again. But he calls Rudius out for seeming like he's always looking down on others and wallowing through life like he's the only one who's ever suffered. 
The young mage tries to apologize and promises to stay out of sight from now on. But the drunk adventurer isn't having it, and his friends have to drag him away. Some time later, Rudius hears about Mimir's death and Sarah's disappearance. The party wants to go looking for her, but there's a nasty blizzard outside. The young mage asks where they lost the archer, before excusing himself and setting out on his own. Upon exiting town, Rudius clears the weather using magic and begins his search. He contemplates why he's doing it while effortlessly dispatching creatures along the way. He stumbles upon Mimir's remains. He gathers what he can for the other's peace of mind, and then discovers an unconscious Sarah bound to a tree, which proceeds to attack him. They head to a nearby cave, and Rudius takes care of her wounds with magic. Sarah wonders if the rest of the party is okay, and he breaks the news to her. She thanks him for coming to save her, and they return to town. Suzanne chews him out for being reckless, but they're all glad to see Sarah alive and well. After saving Sarah, Rudius starts working with Counter Arrow almost exclusively. His reputation continues to grow, as does his relationship with Sarah. One night, while the group has a few pints, she asks if he'll tag along to go knife shopping the following day. He agrees, but it takes a minute to sink in that she just asked him out. After spending the day shopping, and buying a lovely pair of his and hers hunting knives, the two grab a drink. Sarah wonders aloud why she always drinks more when she's with him, and rests her head on his shoulder. This is it. Time to down his drink and suggest they call it a night. She wants to hang out a bit longer though, so he suggests another tavern. She suggests going back to his place. Rudius starts to panic a bit, catches himself, and then agrees. They head to his room at the inn. He offers her another drink, but she'd rather cut right to the chase. He, however, finds himself faced with an equipment malfunction. She doesn't seem to know how to respond to this and leaves, telling him she's just not that into him anyway before she goes. Rudius heads back to the bar and starts slamming them back when Soldat, the leader of Stepped Leader, walks in. He gives him a hard time, as always. But Rudius has no patience for it and just starts wailing on the guy. It becomes clear that this is about something else entirely, and he doesn't fight back. The guy's buddy seems to support this, telling him to give the kid a break. So he invites Rudius to tell him about it over drinks. Rudius tells him about Sarah and Aris and how they both ditched him at very inopportune moments. Soldat prescribes a bit of recreational activity exactly along these lines and takes Rudius to the red light district. He's presented with a red-haired woman of the night named Elise. Despite recruiting a pro for the job, Rudius just isn't responding. Soldat suggests they just get drunk. Morning rolls around, and the owner wakes them up before closing. On their way back, Soldat tries to impart some wisdom by alluding to his situation in terms of battle strategy. But Rudius is a bit thick sometimes, so he stops mincing words and tells the kid he probably needs to form an emotional connection before trying to get a physical one going, and suggests asking Sarah out again. Still drunk, Rudius runs his mouth, going on about how it doesn't matter if it works out, and she's not even his type anyway. Soldat notices Sarah and Suzanne right behind him, well within earshot. He tries to shut the kid up, but Rudius can somehow fit his entire foot in his mouth. Sarah walks up and slaps him, throws her knife that they bought together on the ground, and storms off, tear-eyed. Rudius picks it up, but Soldat kicks it out of his hand before he can do something even more stupid. Rudius breaks down. Soldat asks him about his family, and learns just how alone he is in that part of the world. He makes him an offer to join their crew, they're headed out to a new labyrinth later that day. Rudius realizes that he's pegged him wrong. Now that the two have gotten to know each other a little, they've both come to understand where the other is coming from. Rudius picks himself back up and agrees to tag along. Elsewhere, Elena Lee's eavesdrops on a conversation about a young mage going by Quagmire Rudius. Using her usual methods of persuasion, she learns of his whereabouts, bringing an end to her search. Rudius accompanies Stepped Leader on a hunt for a red dragon, but they attract the attention of a pack of luster grizzlies on the way. Not that big of a deal for the experienced party. But while they were preoccupied with the bears, they didn't notice the approach of the dragon thereafter. They aren't ready for the attack, and there are casualties. 
While the party falls back, Rudius creates a smoke screen for cover, successfully defends against a fire breath attack, and then casts earth magic, firing large shard-like boulders that pierce its armored flesh. He finishes it off as it stumbles clumsily in the muddy mess he made to battle the Grizzlies, taking it out a bit more easily than he thought he was capable of. The other party members celebrate the young mage's feat, though he tries to remain humble by saying the dragon had already been pretty seriously injured and maybe trying to hide a bit of his power. They return to town with wheelbarrows filled with chunks of flesh cut from the lizard's corpse. Sol invites Rudius to become a full-fledged member of their party. He declines, though. After making his name here, he plans to move on in search of his mother. Later, while having a meal at a nearby inn, an elvish woman walks through the door and zeroes in on Rudius. It's Elena Lees. She joins him and introduces herself, almost letting her nympho tendencies take hold. But she used to be in a party with Paul, and she's friends with Roxy, so that would be weird. Turns out even she draws the line somewhere. She discovers the elven amulet around his neck, a perfect match for the one she carries. She brings news of his mother's whereabouts. She's in the labyrinth city of Rapa on the Begarit continent. If he were to make the journey on foot, it would take at least a year, not to mention the coming winter. And apparently, Zenith is doing well as an adventurer, and Roxy and Paul should have arrived in Begarit by now too, so he shouldn't worry about it. With nothing else going on, Elena Lise decides to stick around for a while and get friendly with the locals. You know what? I can suspend disbelief for magic, dragons, man-gods, and reincarnation, but a window in a chimney? Come on. Or is that code for something? Anyhow, one day, a letter arrives for Rudius sent by the Renoa University of Magic, the school where Roxy studied. He's been invited to study there as a special student, free to use the library and do research however he sees fit, without being bogged down by an actual curriculum. It's an offer made only to exceptional individuals of independent renown. Rudius is suspicious about the letter and seeks the advice of Conrad, a fellow mage who studied there himself. He remembers hearing about special students. This dispels his worries about the letter's authenticity, but he's not sure that this is the time. And despite even Alina Lisa's encouragement, Rudius still thinks it's best to focus on reuniting with his family. Until one night, Rudius is visited again by the man-god, he strenuously advises the young mage to attend the Renoa University of Magic and investigate the mass teleportation event. If he should decide to go find his mother, he will surely regret it, though the man-god refuses to go into any more detail. He then adds that attending the university would put him on the path to resolving the operational condition of his man-bits. It would have been a shorter conversation if he had just said that first. So the young mage bids farewell to Sol and the others thanks them for the past two years, and sets off for Renoa with Elena Lise, who's pretty excited at the prospect of spending some time in a college town. Rudius and Elena Lise arrive at Renoa University and go to find Genus, the author of the letter. After a short meeting, he asks the young mage if he'd be so kind as to take a little test with another student who can perform incantationless casting. They head to a room with a giant sigil on the floor, and he's introduced to a sheepish elven lad named Fitz, the test is a simple mock duel, where incantations are prohibited. The two mages square off, and Rudius worries whether he might have to pay tuition if he fails. So when Fitz goes to cast water magic, Rudius quickly dispels it and counters with earth magic. Small rock bullets graze the elf's face, knocking him off his feet. Fitz is visibly distraught and wonders how the young mage cancelled his spell. Not knowing how niche that type of magic is, Rudius explains that it's a spell called Disturb Magic, which is new to everyone in the room. Suffice it to say, he passed the test. Feeling like he embarrassed his upperclassmen, he quickly goes to help Fitz up, apologizing and promising to make it up to him. As excited as Sylphie is to see her friend and master alive and well, she can't reveal herself there in the hall. Everyone is under the impression that she's Ariel's guard, which she is and that she's a man called Fitz, which she's not. Rudius settles into his new dorm and learns what being a special student means. As long as he attends homeroom once a month, he's free to do as he likes with his time, more like a researcher associated with the school than a student. Elena Lise joins him at the welcoming assembly for new students. Princess Aria, the student president, gives a speech, accompanied by her entourage of Fitz and Lord Luke. Her address is pretty standard stuff, be excellent to each other, etc., etc. But Rudius finds himself drawn to her all the same. 
Later, he attends his first homeroom. And there's Zanoba, who loses it at the sudden arrival of the master sculptor. Another student, Linia, is unimpressed and demands that he present Rudius to her. He wonders if his pupil is being bullied and decides it's best to be courteous with her type. She approves. Turns out she's Gaius' daughter from Doldia. Another girl isn't too enthused by his presence, introducing herself as Persina. She's more or less in the same boat as Lenia. Rudius sits down, and the final student in the class introduces himself as Cliff Grimoire, magical genius. Rudius wonders how he could say that with a straight face, but responds politely nonetheless. Cliff runs down a list of his magical capabilities, and then reveals that he knows a thing or two about Rudius, including that he's a swordsman in addition to being a mage. Apparently, Eris told him, but when Rudius asks how he knows her, he just scoffs. Zanoba tells him that there's one more special student who's even exempt from the monthly homeroom requirement. Following the man-god's advice, Rudius heads to the library to begin his research on the mass teleportation in Fatoa. He runs into Fitz and apologizes again. Fitz says there's no need, and even gives him some useful advice about where to start his research. He gets lunch with Zanoba, when they're interrupted by one of Ariel's entourage, Luke Notos Greyrat, Rudius' cousin, who isn't pleased but isn't surprised about Rudius' ignorance of his existence. Zanoba explains that Luke's really there to protect the princess more than be a student. That evening, while Rudius walks back to his dorm, something falls out of a window, and he catches it out of the air. It's a pair of panties. Suddenly, the entire girl's dorm descends upon him, accusing him of being a pervy thief. Just when it looks like he'll be branded a creep for the rest of his school days, Fitz comes to the rescue. He explains that he dropped them while hanging the princess laundry, and Rudius actually did a service by not letting them hit the ground. Okay, but what's he doing wandering around past the girls' dormitory this late in the evening? Realizing they're not going to let it go, Fitz just threatens the lot with a trip to the infirmary, which does the trick. Rudius can't thank him enough, glad that there are at least a few students on campus who are welcoming. Rudius quickly falls into his routine of school life. He brushes up on his figure-making skills at the behest of Zanoba and continues to research teleportation. It's difficult to find detailed information, though, due to the subject and its practice being something of a taboo. One day, Fitz joins him in the library and admits that he also lost someone during the mass teleportation incident. Despite not being able to look for him, he recently surfaced in good health. The elf wonders if Rudius would be down to research the event together from time to time. Rudius agrees and finds himself feeling maybe a little titillated when he shakes hands with him, but quickly dismisses it. He asks Fitz why he's always wearing sunglasses, but he refuses to go into any detail. The young mage then learns that Fitz sleeps in the girl's dorm since he's a servant of the princess. Rudius continues to pry and asks Fitz if he's always been able to cast without incantations. The elf replies that he had a teacher who taught him how from the get-go, and Rudius, still absolutely clueless, expresses his desire to meet him. Later, Zanoba begs Rudius to teach him how to make figurines, having become an extreme enthusiast of the art form. He's not very good at using magic to create them, though, so Rudius suggests sculpting them the old-fashioned way. But the guy's all thumbs. While talking about it with Fitz in the library, they ask themselves, how do people with no talent or skill get a thing done? Well, buy a slave to do it for them. So the three head into town to check out the markets. Fitz suggests finding a child, since learning incantationless casting from a young age is much easier, and it will increase their mana capacity. They tell the merchant what they're looking for, and it just so happens he's got a six-year-old dwarf girl who would be perfect to train here in stock. Rudius tries to talk to her in her own language, but only begins getting through to her by addressing her despair and apparent lack of will to live. The child finally speaks, asserting that she doesn't actually want to die. They buy the girl and take her out for something to eat. He asks her name, but dwarves don't get proper names until they turn seven. They decide on Juliet, and she starts to warm up to being called Julie. They immediately start teaching the girl how to cast without incantations, on a track towards making figurines, setting their plan in motion. Sylphie starts her day with a run, then dons her Fitz getup and heads to class with Ariel. All the lower-level courses mostly cover things she's already been taught by Rudius back in the day. At night, she thinks about him, 
questioning what she's doing and what she wants. After a month, Julie progresses in her casting and human language lessons. Though she lives as a servant to Zanuba, she isn't kept as a slave, and Rudius considers her an apprentice. One day, Rudius asks Zanuba about his Roxy figurine. Zanuba becomes visibly shaken and reveals the figure in pieces. He stammers out that the two Doldian girls, Lenia and Persina, who bully him regularly, are the cause of the destruction. So they decide to get some payback. They confront them. Rudius gets things rolling by saying it's a joke that the two can't take care of themselves on their own and always have to gang up on someone. He then teases their poor human speech, which pushes them over the edge and they attack. It's no contest. Rudius knocks them both out with relative ease. They take them prisoner, and when they wake up, Rudius makes his case. The figure is the likeness of his goddess, and he projects divine light from his shrine to Roxy, which scares everyone in the room, and the light blinds them of what's really in the box. The girls are each quick to blame the other, but Rudius tells them to shut up so he can think. His faith is quite new, and no punishment for these circumstances is written in stone yet. He goes over how their tribe was quick to persecute him based on completely false pretenses, unlike their current situation. Not knowing what to do, he fills Fritz in. He wants to punish them, but without making them hold a grudge and seek vengeance. Fitz comes up with something, and they head to Rudius' room to dole out punishment, only to find them in a poor condition. The room reeks, and the Doldians are humiliated. They should have left them a litter box in the corner. They clean them up, and the two have very much submitted to Rudius' authority. Fitz goes to work painting further humiliation on their faces that they have to endure for an entire day, and he threatens to make it permanent if they try to wash it off or otherwise mess up. Before the girls leave, they ask Rudius how he's acquired such a diverse skill set, and they're surprised when they find out that one of his masters was Ghislaine of the Doldia tribe, who is Lenia's aunt. This helps solidify their newfound respect for him. Fitz begins to apologize for going too far, but Rudius thinks it's no big deal. His only concern is whether anyone else might know the magic to make the punishment permanent and seal their fate. Fitz then reveals that there is no incantation for making the markings permanent, so they'll be fine. It was an effective threat, though. Fitz takes an interest in his shrine to Roxy, but Rudius stops him before he can open it. That's off-limits. Anything else in the room, no problem. The elf catches him staring at the ever-present sunglasses and asks if he wants to see his face, but chickens out at the last second and hurries away. One day, Rudius happens upon someone getting bullied. It turns out to be Cliff. At first, he's a bit apprehensive, but ends up thanking Rudius. Later, Cliff confesses that he likes Alina Lise and asks Rudius to introduce them, despite the rumors surrounding her. So, Rudius goes to Fitz for advice on how to navigate the situation. Now, we've known for a while that Fitz is Sylphie, so I'm going to treat her with the pronoun she, even though Rudius is still clueless. She tells him to just introduce the pair at the very least, which is actually generous of her to suggest, given that she feels she's very much in the same situation. Rudius takes Cliff to introduce him. Cliff comes off so naively cringy that Elena Lise takes Rudius aside. She tells him that her curse isn't compatible with a monogamous relationship and tells Rudius to wait outside while she lets him down. The next day, Rudius walks into class and drops his bag in shock when he sees the two of them fawning over each other. Apparently something changed her mind and the two are now going steady. It's the time of year when beast people duel to determine who will become the leader of the family, a type of marriage proposal. This explains why both Lenia and Persina haven't been attending class. Instead, they leave Rudius a note explaining this, but that ends with, the rest is up to you. Confused at first, Rudius quickly learns that he's been set up as their champion and becomes inundated with challengers from would-be suitors. He easily defeats the first, but Fitz informs him that there's now a queue of beast people waiting to challenge him thinking their prize would be one of the Doldian princesses. He follows Fitz outside to see all of them laid out in the courtyard with a giant demon having defeated them all. He introduces himself as the Demon King Badigadi, Kirishika's fiancé, 
and informs Rudius that he's there to duel him. While they wait for Fitz to bring him his staff, Rudius asks the Demon King about the Man God, but unfortunately, he doesn't know anything more than Rudius does. But Bodyguardi stops his constant laughter when Rudius mentions his brush with the Dragon God. This prompts the demon to propose a new condition. The young mage gets one shot, one opportunity to wound him, and if he can, he will concede defeat. Rudius concentrates all of his energy on a single magical bullet and fires. It knocks Bodyguardi clean off his feet, leaving the hulking man unmoving on the ground. Rudius is completely flabbergasted, but when the demon recollects himself, he declares the young mage the victor, and then sucker punches him in the face. Rudius is glad to be rid of him, and sets off for class the next day, confident he'll never have to deal with the demon king ever again. That is, until he shows up donning a school uniform at the head of the class. Later on, Luke and Daria learn that Sylphie hasn't told Rudius that she's been disguising herself this whole time. She's been too afraid that Rudius may not remember her from their childhood. The princess encourages her to tell him. What's the worst that could happen? In the library, Rudius asks Fitz if there are any experts in summoning magic. She's surprised he hasn't heard of Silent Seven Star. And it's not that he hasn't, he's just never met the infamous student in person. So he decides to seek her out. But when he arrives at her room, he's completely frozen in fear when she turns to reveal the white mask she wears. It's the girl who was with Orsted. Rudius panics, grasping at his chest, having violent intrusive memories of the dragon god ripping a gaping hole in his chest. He falls down the stairs and is knocked unconscious. He wakes up to a gentle hand caressing his head. It's Fitz. He starts to recount what he thinks is a dream until he notices the girl in the mask sitting there and starts to panic again, and demands to know where Orsted is. She says he's not here, but he might come for him at some point in the future. She wasn't expecting him to show up at the university, and has three questions for him. She holds up a piece of paper with two names written in Japanese. Does he recognize these? Does he speak the language? And which one of them is he? Rudius can't believe his eyes, but he answers truthfully. He does know the language, but neither of the names is his. It turns out that the girl in the white mask is from Japan and bears a striking resemblance to the girl he saw right before getting hit by a truck. She introduces herself as Nanahoshi Shizuka. When she asks his name, he simply says it's Rudius. She's overjoyed to meet another like her and hopes he can help them get back to their world. But he never wants to go back, visibly uncomfortable with this revelation. Unlike him, she was only teleported, whereas he was reborn and grew up with a new family and friends. Apparently, Orsted took her under his wing and they traveled around the world. Rudius asks her about the Man God. Again, she has no more information than he does. She goes on to explain that she doesn't age, has no mana to speak of, and can't defend herself. She wants to make a deal. If he, with his profound mana pool, helps her with her experiments, she'll teach him what he wants to know about magic circles and teleportation, or find someone who can. He accepts. Nanahoshi hypothesizes that the mass teleportation coincided with her arrival, so she might have been the one who caused it, or at least whoever summoned her was. Upon hearing this information, Fitz loses it and attacks her. Rudius has to hold her back and explain that Nanahoshi is a victim too. She didn't do the thing, but is caught up in it somehow. After all that, Rudius tells her that he needs a few days to process everything, and he and Fitz leave. Fitz asks what he thinks of her. Despite rubbing him the wrong way, he trusts her, and Fitz trusts his judgment. After Rudius spends some time helping with Nanahoshi's experiments, Sylphie becomes jealous, unable to understand their connection. It's been a year since Rudius enrolled, and he still practices sword combat every morning, but now he has the boisterous body Gadi watching over him. Since their duel, most of the students steer clear. In class, Cliff is increasingly interested in curses. Rudius doesn't know much on the subject, but reveals that the curse on the superds was transferred to them through objects, the spears they used. 
After, Rudius helps transfer mana into magic circles that Nanahoshi comes up with. Her end goal is to teleport someone from their world, but she does want to avoid causing another mana disaster if they start succeeding. One day, Rudius receives a letter from Soldat. He's in the area and wants to catch up, so Elena Lise and Cliff go along as well. Elena Lise says they're going to give Cliff a crash course in adventuring, so Rudius sets off on his own and runs into Luke and Fitz. He notices something about the way Fitz is carrying himself and wonders if they're on a date. Fitz completely ignores him, and this hits harder than he thought it would, so Rudius heads back to the university. He runs into Fitz at the library and asks about what's going on, but it seems like nothing's wrong. Rudius hypothesizes that the princess must be disguising herself as Fitz in public, which is why he never talks to him outside of the university. That night, Rudius can't get Fitz out of his head. He finally realizes that he's in love with Fitz. The next day, he goes to speak with the headmaster to ask about Fitz's sex, but he just parrots that Fitz is male, though Rudius presses X to doubt. His suspicion is quickly confirmed when he and Fitz have an awkward run-in in the library, and it looks like things are looking up. Well, at least something is. The next day, Luke confronts Rudius about what he might think he knows about Fitz. The young mage tells him he doesn't want any trouble and he ain't no snitch, and runs away. Later, Princess Ariel tells Sylphie that after what just happened, she needs to figure out what she wants. She finally admits that she wants Rudius, and Ariel gives her full support. So Ariel and Luke try to help her figure out how best to approach things, since she's worried about Rudius not remembering her. After a while, Ariel has finalized their plan, and if Sylphie doesn't go through with it, she'll ban any further contact between her and Rudius. At lunch, Fitz approaches Rudius and asks if they can talk in private. Ariel has been bragging about Fitz and committed her to retrieving a special flower from the Forest of Hail. After some convincing, she gets him to agree to come with her alone, since he clearly doesn't understand what's happening, and after all, this is all a ruse. So the two set off. Sylphie asks to try out his staff and causes a rainstorm, so they have to hold up in a nearby cave for a while. Rudius starts having his suspicions. He takes off his wet clothes and notices Fitz refusing to take off anything despite being soaked through. Expressing concern, Rudius tries to be courteous and says he'll look away, but Fitz then asks to be undressed by him. He's reminded of the time when, as a kid, he was in a similar situation. When he finally takes off her glasses, it hits him, and he asks if her name is really Sylphiette. She tears up and admits that she wanted to tell him the whole time. She's been in love with him since they were kids, and even more so now. Rudius knows that if he doesn't tell her how he feels, he could lose her again. He confesses his love and the two embrace. There's one more thing he needs to confess. Even though they're camping out, he can't pitch a tent. He apologizes profusely, but she's not bothered and tells him to stop being so formal. She explains what happened to her since the time she saw him taken away in a carriage. She started getting stronger so she could save him, but then the mass teleportation happened and she was teleported to the palace where she met Ariel and Luke. They return to the university and Sylphie wonders if there's some way to help him with his condition. She goes and tells Ariel and Luke. The princess makes light of the situation, but Luke comes to his defense, feeling sorry for him. He tells them that he may have just the thing. After a while, he comes back with an aphrodisiac, and Ariel chips in with her monthly allowance. They wish her luck, and she gets to work. That night, she goes to Rudius' room, and surprises him by saying she's there to stay the night. They drink and reminisce, and then she whips out the aphrodisiac. Rudius has no qualms, and straight up chugs some of it, and Sylphie grabs it and does the same. After it kicks in, and it kicks in, the two embrace. The next morning, Rudius wakes up to find himself alone. The same feelings of abandonment start to creep in, and he tries to rationalize her absence. He starts to break down, but then hears footsteps. 
Sylvie apologizes for having left. She just wanted to tell her friends the good news. Rudius now fully breaks down, and they hug. It looks like he's cured. Later, they meet with Ariel and Luke. Rudius offers his service to repay them for all their help, despite generally wishing to stay out of the affairs of nobles. He tells them that he has a personal duty to find his family, though, and Ariel asks what that means for Sylvie. Without hesitation, Rudius admits he intends to marry her, of course. Thank you for sticking until the end. Subscribe for more videos like this.